Hey, everybody. Uh, so we're going to talk about some crazy black magic browser technology. It's called WebRTC. Uh, so real quick, show of hands, how many of you have heard of WebRTC before? OK, great. This is awesome. How many of you have heard of the data channel part of WebRTC? OK, so good number, but not as many. And uh, how many of you have actually built something, like done a hack with uh, WebRTC data channel before? OK, so very few. So um, uh, we're going to do a deep dive. Um, I've been working on a WebRTC project for uh, the last like five to six months. Um, it's called Peer CDN. Um, it's a peer-to-peer uh, -peer distributed CDN that you can um, add to your website with a single line of JavaScript. And it turns all of your visitors into a peer-to-peer -peer network to distribute your site's content. So it's sort of you know, decentralizing the web again. Um, and um, it sort of ties in nicely with the last talk, actually. I think it's really exciting because um, with WebRTC, we can start to um, build some of these um, nice user experiences um, with peer-to-peer -peer technology. So instead of you know, having a user install something on their computer in order to participate in, in like Tor or Freenet, or um, there's this a new thing called uh, BitMessage, which uses peer-to-peer uh, -peer to send email to people. Um, instead of that, we can actually build this with WebRTC. And you know, that's um, mind-blowingly awesome, I think. Um, you know, because you'll be able to visit a website and get all that same power, but without ever leaving your browser. So, um, so as I mentioned, it adds peer-to-peer -to, -peer to the browser. There are two aspects to WebRTC. There's the protocol, which is standardized by the IETF, and then there's a, a JavaScript API, which is what you'll see as you're building a WebRTC app, and um, that's standardized by the W3C. Uh, and so, um, so uh, this is sort of how you might build um, something that sort of looks like peer-to-peer -peer in the past. You might have you know, sockets open to a server and then messages passing through this central server. So this is how like, Facebook chat works, for example. Um, and with WebRTC, we can start to do stuff like this. So we can eliminate the middleman completely um, and connect directly two browsers to each other or, or potentially multiple browsers. You, know, you can do interesting topologies and things like that. So, like, first of all, like, oh my God, right? Like, this is this is insane. You can you can do peer to peer in the browser. Like, how how cool is that? I mean, previously you could only do client server server client type communication, but we can now do client client communication on the web with no install. So, you know, this fundamentally changes the nature of the web in a very exciting way. Um, no install required. This is part of the web. This is the web standard. Um, and it works today in Chrome and Firefox. So you can go out and use this right now. So specifically, the data channel part of WebRTC is what interests me the most. Uh, most people have been talking about the video and audio aspects of it. But the data channel lets you send any kind of data you want between peers. You can be text. It can be binary. Um, there are, are two transport types, reliable, which emulates TCP semantics, and unreliable, um, which is, emulates UDP semantics. And the API is dead simple. It's just like a WebSocket. You can send, um, and you can get messages when um, somebody sends data to you. Really easy, really straightforward. So some ideas for what you can build with data channel. Um, Real-time chat isn't, you know, it's one example, but you, know, you can sort of do that with, um, with, with WebSockets already. But where you start to see really interesting use cases in things like file sharing, um, super low latency networking for uh, multiplayer games, you can start to now do first-person shooters in the browser. So first-person shooters require um, really uh, low latency networking. Um, and uh, distributed databases, uh, DHTs, sort of mad science-y kind of stuff. Um, and uh, this is the last couple are really interesting to me, uh, the dark web and uh, CDNs. So I think that um, especially with the dark web stuff, you can, you, know, you can start to envision like we can actually build Tor for, um, for, for the web, right? Imagine being able to access this kind of, um, these kinds of hidden services without needing to install anything on your computer. Um, it's going to open this up to a whole bunch more people um, and, and, and help to make this kind of stuff more mainstream and help everyone um, to be uh, a participant. Because now you don't have to install anything on your computer. You can just be passively on a website and part of a peer-to-peer -peer network that's helping to you know, enable freedom for people around the world.
Um, so, so this is an example of something that's been built with, with WebRTC data channels already. This is Banana Bread. How many of you have played around with Mozilla's uh, Banana Bread demo? So this is a, a first-person shooter in the browser. It uses data channels to talk peer-to-peer -peer, um, for, for the multiplayer. Um, this is ShareFest. Uh, this is really cool. This is a way to send files uh, from um, your computer to, to a friend's computer, and it solves that uh, perennial problem of, like, I, I need to get a file to my friend, um, and he's you know, right over there across the, the, the way, and um, I don't have a USB stick on me, and I can't use Dropbox because it's like a five gig file, and I don't want to wait for that to upload. So um, with WebRTC data channels, you can just drop the file on your browser. It generates a URL. You IM that to your friend, or he types it in. It's really short. And then um, the file starts to stream directly from your machine to his machine. And if you're on a LAN, the data never even leaves the LAN. So it's, it's blazing fast. Um, it's really cool. Uh, this is a cool project. So this is built by my friends uh, Sophia and Bree um, at Stanford. And it's uh, an IDE in your browser. Um, you can build a, sort of a ser server-side web app with routes, with views. You even have a data store. And um, when you're finished, you push publish, and you get a URL. And then you can send that out to your friends. You can email it out. And as long as you keep that window open, your browser is acting as a server. So everybody fetches the web page directly from your machine. And um, you, can do, you can do things like simple survey forms to send out to your friends to collect you know, feedback for a trip idea or whatever. Um, really neat stuff. Um, yeah, so um, a few more things to know about data channel that, that's uh, pretty cool is um, you, there's no browser permission prompt, so this just, this just works. You can, you can literally go and do this right now in, in Chrome and Firefox, and um, nobody will know a thing. Uh, <laughs> um, you also get uh, encryption, so every peer-to-peer every, uh, -peer connection is automatically encrypted. And uh, this is really important, uh, NAT hole punching. So um, NATs are a huge problem for peer-to-peer. -peer. When um, Skype came out initially, uh, for the first few years, they spent a ton of, of engineering effort trying to figure out how do we get around um, NATs. Uh, and this is just solved for you by WebRTC. So what do I mean by the NAT problem? Um, you basically have uh, you know, these routers that are in front of you when you're trying to talk to the internet, and they um, give you a sort of like a fake, uh, like a local IP address that the world doesn't see. And so there are two problems with this. One is that uh, an individual browser doesn't even know his own IP address because um, that's, that's hidden from him. Um, so he can't tell the peer how to reach him. Um, and the second problem is the router will actually not allow incoming connections. So we have to do this thing called hole punching, where you send a request going out of the router, and that adds an entry into the routing table. And then the router will then allow future um, requests coming in on that port to go through. So WebRTC takes care of all this for you. This is not something you have to think about as a developer, which is great. Um, so one of the first things you have to think about when you're building a, a WebRTC application is how are my peers going to find each other? So this is up to you as an app developer to um, solve. Um, and that's good. Um, you want to be able to, to, to solve this in, in, in your own way, in a way that makes sense for your application. So um, a typical example might be um, if you uh, are building like a chat application, you want every user to report um, that, that they're online to the server. And then the server makes that information available to the relevant people, so let's say your friends. And then um, when your friends want to connect to you, they, um, you know, they click on your name, and then the server does an introduction. So it introduces the two peers to each other and facilitates the peer-to-peer um, -peer connection. So that process is called signaling, and um, it's um, sort of an intimidating process at first. Um, I know it, it's scared a couple of my friends away from, um, from playing with WebRTC, so I want to go through it right now just so that everybody can see that it's not really that scary. Um, so um, this is a typical architecture for a WebRTC application. Um, you, you have a central server just initially to facilitate the connection. Um, and so um, let's say that you have like uh, two cats that want to talk to each other. Uh, so the first, the first cat says, uh, can I have a data channel, please? Um, so he's found out about the peer that he wants to talk to. Um, he knows maybe the, the peer's username or ID or whatever, whatever, however you identify your peers in your application. It's up to you. So the first step is um, that peer creates an offer. 
And what's in that offer is a couple of things that are important. One is a password that um, helps to encrypt the peer-to-peer connection. So it's just a randomly generated uh, password. And then um, uh, also the constraints of the browser. So what features the browser supports. Because remember, you know, we're doing, you know, the WebRTC has to interoperate with Chrome, Firefox, and potentially other um, browsers. And so every browser is going to, you know, have a different version and have support different features. So that's all described in this offer. And this is um, sent to the other peer. When the peer receives that, he produces an answer, which is uh, sort of the same thing but in reverse, and sends that over. So now both the peers know about each other, and they know their, their, their constraints. So the, the, second, um, the, the second step is um, to hole punch through the NAT. Um, and so to do that, there's this thing called a stun server, which just sits out on the internet and tells peers what their IP address is from the outside world, since the peers don't know on their own. And so each peer sends a message to the stun server asking, you know, what's my IP? They get a response. And uh, afterwards, they have what's called an ICE candidate. And so that's basically just an IP address and a port number. Uh, and then they send that to the other peer, and um, that peer sends his ICE candidate to uh, the other side. And so now they both know um, the IPs that they need to talk to each other on. Now, you could have multiple ICE candidates. Um, let's say you have um, a computer that's like, plugged into an Ethernet and is on Wi-Fi. You have two interfaces now. So you know, there could be multiple of these being sent. Um, another um, cool thing about, about these ICE candidates is they're prioritized. So if you're on a LAN, you're going to also send your local IP to the other peer. And if, um, if you're on a LAN, then it will prefer that over uh, your public IP. So you'll be able to get really fast speeds and never leave your LAN. So now you have a data channel. That's it. Pretty straightforward. And this could also be for video and audio as well. Same process. Not so bad, right? Did everybody get that? Did that make sense? Cool. So there's a few limitations. Um, what's cool, actually, is just today, um, that first limitation, Chrome and Firefox interoperability, has gone away. So Chrome and Firefox can do data channels uh, now, uh, talk to each other. It's awesome. Yeah. It's been a long time coming. Um, and then Chrome um, also finally fixed, uh, you can send binary data, and you can um, use reliable transport now. That was fixed a couple weeks ago. Um, we still don't have Safari and IE support. I think that's because Apple wants you to use their FaceTime thing, and Microsoft wants you to use Skype, uh, which is just the suck. Like, I, I think what's, what's going to happen probably is that, uh, like with WebGL, uh, eventually enough developers will start building applications that, that use it that they're just going to have to come around to it eventually. So um, you know, go out there and build, build cool stuff so that they have to support the open web. And there are a few bugs here and there, but they're, they're, they're not a really a big deal. You can work around them. So, um, so Chrome and Firefox together are about 60% of the, of the market. So you can start to build real applications that use this today. OK, so this is my thing, Pure CDN. Um, it's, uh, like I mentioned, it's a script you add to your site. It reduces your bandwidth costs by offloading most of the um, serving of your, of your videos, your images, uh, audio file downloads to your visitors. So the way to think of it is like browser cache sharing. Uh, it's a um, pretty, like I said, pretty easy way to get started. If you don't have a CDN on your site already, then you can just sign up for Pure CDN, and uh, it takes like two seconds to install. You literally don't have to change anything about your site other than adding the script. If you already have a CDN, uh, it still makes sense, because um, you can put it in front of that CDN, basically. It, it, it will, it will uh, your, basically, Pure CDN will try to do its best to serve stuff, and when it can't, it'll fall back to your CDN. But it will, it will take care of most things. Most sites follow sort of a power law where um, a, few, a few pages on your site are really popular. So like the home page, anything linked from the home page, anything that's going viral in social media at the moment, that kind of thing. And so for those pages, it's really effective at um, pretty much you'll never have to hit the server for those pages, except for you know, the, the HTML and stuff is still, is still, is still going to hit the server. This is currently just, just for static resources. Um, so one cool use case is if you have like a remote village, and um, they have a really slow um, uplink or, or, and downlink, typically. So they have like maybe satellite internet. Um, with, with a pure CDN-enabled site, 
um, if two people are accessing the same site, um, once one guy has the, the content, the other, uh, the other person can just fetch that over the LAN, and that's blazing fast. And so for, for um, certain use cases, this makes browsing the internet actually like, tolerable, where previously it was really not a, a nice experience at all. Um, university computer labs are another good use case. A lot of times, um, at the beginning of a school year, you'll have a, a CS a professor will send out an email to, um, to all the students and say, download this four gigabyte VM. And everybody hits the server, uh, and it, it dies. Uh, and so with, with Pure CDN, they could just pull it from their neighbor next door in the other dorm room uh, without ever uh, hitting the, the main server. So I have a quick demo of it. Uh, so, oh, this is annoying. Um, maybe we'll skip the demo. It works. Go to PureCDN.com. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a screencast of, of me showing it off and stuff. So why is this cool? Like, I mean, like, it's sort of, I, I just think that, like, this and things like this are the direction the web needs to go. So the, the initial vision of the Internet was, that it was this network of networks, right, where, where no one network was more important than, uh, was too important uh, as compared to other networks. And um, no one node is really important, right? Like it sort of tolerates, uh, it tolerates like downtime and, 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 and like uh, inaccessible parts of the network and sort of routes around it. And so sort of like a really decentralized web. And we've gone away from that in the last few years, uh, in the last few, few, few decades. Um, and I think that with WebRTC, we can start to reverse that trend. So Pure CDN is one, one attempt to do that. Um, and I, I hope you guys will go out and, and build more, you know, more ways of doing this. Uh, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how uh, Pure CDN works, so you'll get to see some of the challenges that you might have to deal with in, in building a data channel application. So uh, we have a, you know, a central, like I said, a central tracker that does the peer introductions and manages sort of who's seeding what content. And then most of the logic is in the client side script. So the clients determine um, you know, when they want to connect to a peer. Um, they handle all the sort of file splitting and recombining that needs to happen, file verification, seeding, um, stuff like that. So one of the first questions people ask is if I put this on my site, you know, what happens if um, things go wrong? Will, will you break my site? And so the answer is no, we won't break your site. Um, if the tracker's down, um, we, uh, we immediately fall back and load your site normally, like, like the script wasn't there. I mean, if peers are slow, we, we get rid of those peers over time um, and, and prune them out. And um, there's also sort of a sanity uh, speed check. So if the overall speed of the peer CDN network drops below a certain uh, user uh, configurable threshold, then we just cut our losses and fetch the rest of the data from the central server, so from your main server. Um, and we use HTTP range requests, so we can just fetch those bits that we don't already have, that we haven't already fetched from the peer-to-peer -peer network. And then we combine the file together and then display it to your users. So even in the worst case, um, when things go wrong, it still works and it's still pretty fast. So what if peers are malicious? Um, so the peers can be malicious for a few reasons. One could be a bug in our code. Um, you could have maybe the network munges the data somehow, um, or peers could just, you know, be trolls and be sending you like, I don't know, goatsy or something when you're trying to like look at a cat picture. So like, to, to um, get around that, we have the server, central server, that does a hash list, uh, a SHA-1 hash list of the file. So it splits the file up into pieces in the way, in a similar way to uh, BitTorrent, and it hashes each piece, and then that gets sent down to each peer before um, the peer-to-peer uh, download starts to happen. And so peers can actually verify every single piece um, before they use it. And we use a web worker pool, so we can stream the, the uh, data that we're getting uh, uh, from peers and, and sort of hand it off very quickly to the web worker pool. And um, that, uh, that, that happens without a copy, actually. We use this thing called transferable objects, where you can just take a binary blob and just hand it to a web worker without a copy. Um, and, uh, and so we discard invalid data, and we basically never want to display unvalidated data to the user. 
So um, there's a lot of things I want to talk about, but I'm running short on time, so I'm going to go kind of quick through these last slides. So we automatically take over all the images on your website. You don't have to change anything. Now, this is kind of crazy because um, th that, that, that shouldn't work. Like, that's actually, if you, try to, if you try to write JavaScript that prevents images from loading, you'll find that it doesn't work. You can't do that. The reason is, in order to make uh, the browser really fast, what, these, what the browser vendors have done is they've, they actually have two parsers that are parsing the HTML that comes into your page. There's the normal one, which has to block on uh, style sheets and scripts. Because, you know, y you, um, they can be fetched in parallel, but they have to be executed in a very specific order defined by the standard. So, for example, style sheets have to be applied to the page before um, your script scripts run, because the scripts might rely on the styles or check the styles or something. Um, meanwhile, though, like, it, as this HTML is coming in from the server, the browser has a second parser called the speculative parser, which um, takes anything that looks like an external resource and immediately fetches it um, and fires off these requests. So our script doesn't have a chance to stop it. So what do we do to get around this? There's this cool technique called capturing, which was uh, created by this guy, Sean, at Mobify. Um, super crazy hack. Basically, you... You have a script in the top of, the, of your page that uh, document.writes a plain text tag into the page. Who here has heard of the plain text tag? Yeah, it's like from like, I don't know, 1980 or something. It's like the first version of Netscape. Basically, if, you, if, if this is included in your page, everything that follows will be treated as plain text and not as HTML. So, and there's no way to close it. Once you start plain text, everything is plain text. <laughs> so we put one of these in the page. But our script is already running, so we're ch we can do stuff while we ruin everything else on the page, right? <laughs> so we, we, we do a display none also, so, we don't, so the user doesn't see the HTML flash. And we wait for all the HTML to finish loading, and then we, we do a regex over that HTML and change every source to be data pure CDN source instead. Uh, and then we inject that back into the page. And this is so gross, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> so... I want to just say, like, Brendan Eich, I think, has a quote, always bet on JavaScript. Well, I, I want to say always bet on the web. Like, with the web, there's always a way to do, to do what you want to do, and it might be the dirtiest thing ever. Um, it might make you die a little bit on the inside. Um, but it's also really awesome that you can pretty much always make it work. So um, how do we stream video and audio? There's this thing called the Media Source API. It lets you pipe uh, binary data from JavaScript into a video tag or audio tag. Um, and... There's a bit of work you have to do to handle seeking, like you have to understand uh, the, way, the way the file is laid out so you know when they click on like one minute in that you're supposed to fetch particular bytes, but that's possible. Um, for privacy, um, by definition, peer-to-peer -peer is going to reveal your IP, so there's no way around that. Um, so maybe if you're behind a NAT, you don't care, or maybe you just only use this on uh, non-sensitive websites. But to be honest, I'm not happy about this a particular uh, bit of the equation. I have some crazy ideas about maybe how to solve it, but um, it's sort of an open problem. Um, for latency, we have a bunch of, of, of round trips that we can't get around because of the signaling process that I talked about. So there's a round trip to find peers, there's a round trip to, uh, to do signaling, there's a round trip to stun, there's a round trip to send ICE candidates, there's a round trip to establish the peer-to-peer -peer connection, and there's a round trip to, start, uh, to send a request to the peer and start getting the data back from the peer. So some of these are, you can do in parallel, some of them, um, you can, a couple of the steps you could eliminate, like the, you could unify the first two into one, I think. Um, but this is sort of another sort of open, open problem. Uh, one quick solution that we, uh, we, we're using is you can basically just only load, um, for, for images, you can only load the ones that are below the fold over peer-to-peer. -peer. So everything above it just load normally, and it'll, it'll appear to the user to be pretty fast, right? Even if it takes an, an extra second for the ones below the fold, it's all good. Um, so I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip this, I think. Uh, um, so... Yeah, so um, a few challenges with WebRTC apps. Testing is really hard. There, there wasn't any kind of testing framework that we could use to test this. We use continuous deployment, so uh, continuously deploying your CDN you know, is kind of a crazy idea. You might <laughs> deploy a bug and take down everyone's sites, so we had, we, have, we had to do a lot of fallback, like I mentioned, and um, we built our own test harness that spawns uh, Chrome and uh, Firefox instances, um, full, like, not, not headless. You can't use headless because um, the headless browsers uh, out there don't actually have the WebRTC components built in. At least they didn't when, um, when we started building this. So we had to use the Canary and Nightly versions. 
um, and I'm going to open source that really soon. Um, we, um, we, we ran into a whole bunch of Chrome bugs out of memory bugs. So um, Chrome, it turns out, is a 32-bit app still, which is, is just insane. So if, you, if you're doing any kind of processing of big binary files, you have to be very careful to not uh, use more than two gigs of RAM. And it's really easy to do that because the array buffer implementation is super janky and um, inefficient. Basically, so it used to be that um, if you if you make a hundred megabyte array buffer, it would use like four hundred megabytes of RAM for no reason. So it's very easy to run over that two gig limit very quickly. They've improved it a little bit since. It now only uses three times as much RAM as it's supposed to. But uh, be careful if you're you'll, you'll get a, you'll get a sad tab um, uh, with no explanation if you go over that limit. So yeah, if you want to learn more about this, check out the site. It's purecityn.com, and give us your feedback. And um, the last thing I want to mention is, um, like, a f like three, four days ago, I, um, I thought of this idea. I want to I build BitTorrent in the browser. And I've been tossing this idea around for, for many months. But um, what I think, uh, I, I, sort of my revelation of a few, few days ago is that I think you could, you could modify the protocol in a way where you could have, basically, a website, like a tracker search engine, where you go to the page, you search for the completely legitimate, non-copyrighted movie you want to watch. And then when you, when you find the movie you want to watch, you can push play, and it'll just play immediately in the browser using the BitTorrent protocol. And um, the way that would work is you um, extend the, the DHT protocol that BitTorrent has for peer discovery. So you, you basically add um, a, a method to it where um, you can ask a, a DHT node to introduce you to another, um, to, to another node. And um, that, that's sort of like the signaling process. You have the peers do that signaling. Um, and then you can get introduced to, to other peers. And so it's sort of just this extra method on BitTorrent DHT. And with that, you could have completely serverless, trackerless operation of uh, BitTorrent. And um, if you're interested in this idea, please come find me and let's talk about it because I'm building this right now and I want this to exist. So thank you guys.